to tell you now about uh, giving you a little introduction to biomedical data science. Um, so, um, first of all, you know what <laughs> what is biomedical data science? What is this uh, this subject? Um, and I'm going to start by just kind of placing it into the context of data science in general. And I want to start out with these um, paradigms for uh, science uh, and knowledge. Uh, these were developed by uh, Jim Gray, who's a sort of well-known computer scientist. And he kind of came up with these um, different paradigms for science around, um, I think it was around 2000 or so, or a little before 2000, uh, he came up with these. Uh, paradigms is that um, the empirical paradigm, and this is the sort of, um, I don't know, way we kind of dealt with the natural world um, thousands of years ago, you know, we would uh, describe uh, natural uh, phenomena and just look at it, you know, this is very much the Aristotelian way of thinking about life. And then another one that emerged afterward is the theoretical uh, paradigm. And here the idea is, as opposed to just having descriptions, we have um, sort of mathematical models, generalizations from these things. You know, you might think of Newton here, and I think would be a good um, illustration of that. And um, the third one is the computational branch. Now this of course was, uh, gave, happened with the advent of the digital computer, which was uh, developed in the uh, 1950s. And one of the first things people started doing with the digital computer is, uh, simulating all these uh, models. And so, you know, one of the things they might simulate, for instance, is a rocket trajectory, um, you know, using uh, Newtonian mechanics, or another thing they might do, for instance, was simulate weather um, and so forth. And, you know, this sort of all makes sense. And then, uh, then he had this idea that there was a, a third or sorry, a fourth paradigm that uh, was, that sort of came about. And that what he called data exploration, we probably would call it data science now. He also used the term e-science. And here the idea was not to focus so much on simulating, uh, but using the computer to um, kind of capture a lot of information about a phenomena and explore that um, information. So um, uh, this uh, type of data exploration branch, it, it really, um, emphasizes different aspects of computation than the simulation branch. And here I'm just kind of um, contrasting these things more. The simulation um, or the computational branch is really more about, um, you know, calculating equations, using a supercomputer, um, using sort of prediction based on physical principles, which is very, very important. The um, data exploration or data science, data mining branch, is more about kind of classifying information, finding new relationships between things, and as opposed to emphasizing so much the speed of computation. Here we're um, emphasizing the way computers have huge memories. You can store lots of information in a database um, and sort of uh, also kind of network these databases together and so forth. So uh, Jim Gray um, died actually in an accident in 2007 and some of these ideas came out in kind of published form in 2009, and they're kind of prescient ideas. As you can see, they kind of were a little bit before the idea of kind of data science as a sort of a, a, a new field, but I think they kind of um, really anticipated it well. Um, so here's a, a definition for kind of where we are now um, in uh, data science, and I, I kind of got this um, these bullets actually from uh, Dan uh, Spielman, who used them to kind of describe the uh, data science initiative um, at Yale. You probably know we have a new um, we have a new, new department of it. We have a new institute of it, and so forth. Uh, so, so these are some uh, of the key points. Uh, one is that uh, data science encompasses the uh, entire life cycle of data. You know, so you of course have to know how the data is gathered. Um, and you also have to know how it's stored, annotated, managed, and so forth. And this is actually a very important uh, part of data science that sometimes is neglected, you know, how we actually um, understand, represent the data on the computer. And then, of course, there's this notion of analyzing the data. Um, and here, of course, we have a lot of the traditional ways of looking at it statistically or more, more recently with machine learning and deep learning and all these uh, algorithmic ideas we have for um, looking at the data. 
And what I think is important is also to make connections between this type of mining and uh, the physical modeling, you know, the third type of um, uh, third paradigm. And a, a big aspect, I think, of mining the information is also um, visualizing the information really large scale and then using this to actually make decisions and potentially even policy. So, you know, data science is a practical uh, type of um, uh, discipline and we want to um, answer questions, you know, that people have. Now in biomedical data science, of course, we're gonna be answering questions uh, in the biomedical domain, but of course, in more in general, people wanna answer questions in uh, so social domain and, uh, you know, whatever type of domain they're, they're doing their data science work. Um, now, one other thing I kind of add on here is that uh, a lot of, I, I think a big thing in, in data science also is to really ask, understand that there's secondary aspects of data where a lot of times data is collected for one use, but a lot of times the mining really gives rise to um, uh, different conclusions. And I call this kind of looking at what's called the data exhaust. And I think the big, um, the, the big topic here is really this notion of privacy. So a lot of times we collect a lot of information for one purpose, but that information can really be uh, mined and looked at for another purpose that often has to do with invading people's privacy. And this is a very important issue in biomedical uh, data science. And another type of aspect too is kind of just studying uh, what's called science of science, how science itself evolves and changes, looking at the data that we gather on science, not to study uh, the, not, not to make scientific conclusions, but to study how scientists do science, which is, I think kind of interesting. Um, so, um, you know, you probably all know this, but data science has become a very popular uh, term. I think, you know, when I originally started um, teaching this class, it was called bioinformatics and people didn't even really know about data science and it really wasn't a word. And now it's become um, really kind of a hot term. And I, I think it's kind of amazing about 10 years ago, the Harvard Business Review had, um, had this uh, article, data scientist the sexiest job of the 21st century. I, I wouldn't have imagined seeing such a, uh, a bizarre article um, when I started doing this, but now here, here it's a popular thing. And you probably all know that uh, data science is integral to a lot of the big uh, companies that we hear about all the time, Google, Amazon, Walmart, whatever. And it's really important. And mostly this is in a commercial context, You know, literally just thinking about the things we see, ads, media, and so forth. And we're gonna, of course, think about it now in a scientific context. Now, I think it's important to realize that scientific data science really predates uh, this the hype for data science. I mean, long, long before, you know, data science became a popular thing with, you know, Facebook or ad placing or whatever people are doing now, people were mining very large data sets. And I, th I think the real uh, people that really developed this uh, were a lot of people, some some people in biological science, but mostly in uh, physics. You know, so a lot of the um, dealing with very large data sets comes from the big data sets people developed from, for instance, what's called the Large Hadron Collider (LHC). This is um, where they've made a lot of discoveries in particle physics, and also th there's a laboratory. Uh, it that one of the most important laboratories, the CERN, that's maybe where you know they originally developed the World Wide Web and the whole machinery for the World Wide Web comes from that, um, that lab. And people have been doing uh, sort of analyzing large data sets and so forth in higher physics and also in genomics long before, uh, or, or biology long before data science was popular. We have, as we'll talk about, you know, the human genome and a lot of these very big data sets were really uh, a big thing. We also have the, the notion of the connectome. And a, a big important area, which I'll talk about also, is the area of looking at the earth and the skies, uh, astronomy and earth science. Uh, I think these are particularly important areas because, um, again, people don't appreciate, but again, long before um, data science was important in the commercial world, these were people that were really thinking about how to fuse large amounts of information uh, from, say, satellites and whatnot with um, simulation to do weather forecasts. And now, so in, in scientific data science, people have kind of come up with some terms to kind of categorize this. Uh, one of these, what they call the Vs. And um, I've got a list of these Vs here. And so it's kind of how, um, how much data you have, the volume, how truthful that data is, you know, how accurate the uh, veracity, its value. Also uh, a very big issue that's unappreciated is how the velocity of the data, um, how 
quickly you're getting data, you know, that really governs the type of analyses uh, you can look at. And also very important, particularly in the biological context is variety. Um, you know, how heterogeneous is your, uh, is the data that you're trying to analyze. Um, oops, let's see, how do we go? Oops, no, what have we done here? Oops, sorry. <laughs> so, um, uh, so now I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, scientific data mining. And I think one of the key uh, aspects of scientific data mining is this merging this, um, uh, the, the mining type and the statistical stuff with the more traditional physically based uh, models. And um, I, I think weather forecasting, I think is a great, um, like as, as I was saying, a really a great model for this, because I think originally people tried to um, forecast the weather just from this simulation approach. And this is many, many years ago in the 1950s. And maybe people know this, but maybe not, but it was tremendously unsuccessful. And it actually gave rise to this idea of the butterfly effect, which is a very important uh, concept when, when simulating things, which really has to do with the dependency on initial conditions. And people were not at all successful simulating the weather. And even in the 1960s and so forth, they couldn't even guess maybe a day earlier what the weather would be. Uh, but then what they realized is that they could take those physical models and then couple them to massive data collection. This is from satellites, weather balloons, whatnot, and put those together. And nowadays, uh, weather forecasting is quite a miracle. I mean, you probably don't realize it, but it's amazing. You just open your iPhone every day, you get a picture of the next 14 days, in a kind of statistical or probabilistic way and you use it uh, to make decisions. You know, you decide how to dress. We all obviously probably woke up yesterday and saw, oh, it's gonna be a big snow uh, fall today. We are gonna plan our day in relation to that. And this stuff works actually very well and people use it um, all the time. And so I think that's a tremendous um, success story. Now within the uh, biology uh, world, people have in this, have developed this field they call systems biology, which I think really encompasses a lot of the aspects of the data science aspects, but also a little bit more of the simulating aspects. And, and there's a term that they use for this, which I'm going to describe here. It's called the four M's. And this is really developed by this uh, scientist, Doug, Doug Laufenberger. And basically it's sort of shown in this, uh, another circle here. And the circle shows the notion of we can measure stuff. And then of course we can build data sets and we can mine those data sets. But then there's a new part from mining the data sets, we can connect them to physical or um, models. And then with those models, I think one of the key ideas is that we can um, make predictions and we can actually think about manipulating things, you know, making kind of manipulating a model and making predictions and then testing those predictions and then connecting it back into the measurement and so forth. And I think that's a nice um, little flow to think about the way we want to approach um, biomedical data science. Um, okay, so let me tell you some aspects of biomedical data science now. Uh, so I'm going to tell you some key bits. One, I think, is really this notion of the, the scale and the types of data we look at. And so this, you can tell I like circles. <laughs> so here's another circle we have. And so this is the type of data that really goes into biomedical data science. Um, obviously, I think genomics and omic data, that's um, genomic, proteomic, metabolomic data, are really, I think, the to some degree, the, the leading ship of um, uh, biomedical data science really leading the way with this. And there's a lot of these ohms you will we'll talk about in, in a bit. Um, another big source of data you probably heard about is imaging data. There's a tremendous amount of imaging data in biomedical data science. And there's also, of course, what we might describe as phenotype data, which is very, very important. And this is the type of data, of course, that we relate to genotype data. Um, in a medical context, this phenotype data is really what's known as EHR or um, uh, health record data. But increasingly, we also have a new uh, data source, and this is really this notion of wearable sensors and sensors people are uh, just, they have in life and feeding that into the phenotypic description as well. Um, so one can kind of um, see this kind of relationship between genotype and phenotype and kind of getting more information about them. It's kind of a huge uh, success story and it, it, it's been a huge success story. And I, I think I just kind of chart that um, sort of progression here. So the early 1950s, of course, in addition to marking the advent of the digital computer, they also marked the advent of um, molecular biology where we got the double helix from Watson and Crick. 
Um, actually, look, lo and behold, about 40 years later, we have the first uh, sequenced genome, and that was Haemophilus influenza, which was, uh, you know, I think a real um, uh, sort of uh, eye opener and so forth. And then just a short time later, we have the human genome being sequenced, and then the notion of uh, thousands of genomes being sequenced. This is the Thousand Genomes Project, which maybe had its uh, heyday around 2000. Eight or 2010. And then now, nowadays, we're kind of really into this notion of population scale integrated health data for um, precision medicine. And I think the UK Biobank is kind of the a leader in this type of thing where you're collecting the genomes of people, but you're really coupling it to tremendous amounts of additional information about these people. And the hope, of course, is this is going to enable a, um, a better uh, form of medicine uh, in the future, a better form of health for that matter. Um, so when we think about um, the, uh, d d the amount of data increasing and so forth in these disciplines, I think it's, it's useful to think about these in terms of kind of scaling laws. And these scaling uh, ideas were really popularized in terms of the speed of computing. So one of the famous uh, laws here is this notion of Moore's law, which you've probably all heard of, and it's kind of shown here. Um, Moore was one of the uh, first people who really worked on, um, I think he worked with Fairchild Semiconductor and then Intel, and he really worked on the original computer chips. And he found that they were essentially um, doubling in speed or the number of transistors for chips was doubling every once in a while. So on a log uh, graph, that's a straight line. And so you could kind of just do a straight line fit and you'd see like, oh, you'd anticipate a few years later, the speed would double and so forth. And this, this idea really took over the um, tech industry and so forth. And it, it you know, it, they almost built it into the way they rolled out products. Now in the, um, the data gathering world, the biological science, we've had a kind of almost like a super Moore's law too. And that's a uh, slightly different. It's how much data we can gather for a given amount of money. <laughs> and so this picture shows the amount of nucleotide bases uh, that we could uh, get or how much it would cost to sequence a human genome uh, each year from say the original human genome 2001, 2002, 2003 and so forth. And this again is a um, uh, exponential increase. You see it's a, a sort of linear line um, on a log uh, plot here. Uh, but then around 2007, an amazing thing happened. And that amazing thing was the advent of what's called next generation sequencing. And you can see that the amount of data started to increase substantially faster than even the exponential increase that you have in say Moore's law. And, and it's quite amazing. And that, that happened, that continued uh, for a couple more years. And then it's, it's subsequently leveled off into more of a traditional exponential increase, which is kind of where we are uh, now nowadays. Um, now, one thing I think is kind of interesting to think about is when you think about this, uh, these scaling laws or uh, Moore's law, it's interesting to um, think about how they relate to um, different approaches people take to the data and different machinery for that. So one, well, you might naively think, oh, if data is increasing, increasing, it means every year, you know, we're as opposed to having four transistors on our chip, we have you know eight and sixteen and so forth. And it's just kind of going up in some straightforward fashion. But it, it's not really like that. What's happening a lot of times is that we're doing that for a while, but then we're swapping in a new technology for that. And a person actually developed a modification on Moore's law uh, for this. It's called Kreider's law. This is a uh, a law that actually just describe the memory on uh, computer systems. Um, and you can see the, um, uh, the Moore's law exponential increase that you have for compute. This is for computer disk drives, okay? Just, just like for transistors. But what Kreider noticed is actually this law is actually made up of a superposition of S curves where each S curve describes a different technology that would be developed that would actually expand and actually provide the exponential increase and then would mature and be supplanted by a new technology. And in the realm of um, computer disk writing, you know, we have here written down some of the different technologies people use. But I think more to the point in terms of um, biomedical data science, 
we can see this kind of Crider laws thing and the different technologies people are rolling out in terms of data gathering and um, uh, sequencing. It's really been quite amazing. I think now the big news is what they call third generation sequencing, which I guess is not so much supplanting yet, but kind of coming after the um, the so that kind of amazing second generation or next generation sequencing boom from Illumina uh, and so forth. And maybe we'll hear a little bit about this stuff later. And here's um, you know just a, a graph showing more for the biomedical scene, just how the uh, data is increasing. And I think it's kind of interesting. This picture shows the amount of data in a number of uh, disciplines. Uh, you have um, the data in genomics, uh, the data in social sciences, uh, something in astronomy. And I think the key thing to realize is that there's a lot of data in biological science and it's exponentially increasing, but it's, uh, it's not quite at the level yet of the amount of data in say astronomy, which has a tremendous, really a quite tremendous amount of data from all the sky surveys, but it's many, many orders of magnitude more than the uh, type of social data sets that people tend to see or, um, you know, sort of a social science uh, data sets. And um, one thing that's kind of interesting to see also when you look at this data scaling is how when the, the, you get a tremendous amount of data, uh, I should say, uh, uh, data being accumulated in one discipline that kind of spills over into more and more things. And this is a very nice graph showing this here. So this shows the amount of nucleotide bases associated with um, publications of papers in different journals. And so let's look at this. This first journal is Nature, which is a traditional journal in genomics. And um, actually this is a log uh, scale here. I should have indicated that more carefully, um, but you can see it's exponentially increasing and each of these big uh, spikes is when there's some big paper in genomics and more uh, data comes out, which is kind of neat to see. And then you can see a number of other journals here in the biological sciences, for instance, Science, Cell, and so forth, that publish a lot of these big nucleotide sets. You can see they have their own exponential increases. Um, not as much as Nature, which has been very much initially the uh, genome of biological sciences. But what's really interesting is if you look at the um, uh, bottom right-hand corner of this figure, you can see down here, um, you can see that, oh, look, there's this exponential increase now in some other journals, such as, um, now I should have uh, written these names more uh, carefully out, but for instance, these journals are like Nature, uh, Chemical Biology, or Molecular Ecology. And so what you see here is, you, you might not think, well, how does DNA sequencing have to do with ecology, or how does it have to do with chemical biology? Not obviously, but because this is such an amazing sensor, it's such an amazing way of gathering a lot of data, increasingly what you see in uh, chemical biology papers is people are using DNA sequencing as a readout, same, same with uh, molecular ecology. And I think you're going to increasingly see this type of phenomenon. Now, what is this scaling in terms of data generation and computation mean for us in biomedical data science was well, changing rapidly our discipline. So originally, um, when they first sequenced the human genome, you can kind of think about the different phases and what happened. Well, they, they do the experiment, they get the sample for the human genome. That was actually not very hard. I mean, you, maybe you've heard the story, the different of even the big participants in the genome went and they just drew their own blood. <laughs> they just got some fairly random people on the street for the reference random human genome. And then most of the effort was really in sequencing, getting all, just building this data set. And so that was where all the money and the effort went. And the analysis, which is what we're focusing on, was important in terms of the assembly and so forth. But yeah, in terms of the downstream analysis, not that much was really done. Now with NGS, what happens? Well, now suddenly the sequencing price decreases. So this kind of blue area decreases and kind of correspondingly, the, the share of the overall pie for the red and the yellow increased. So obviously there's more effort now on getting a good sample, not sequencing anyone's genome, but maybe sequencing a, a particular person's genome that's uh, sick or has a particular condition. And then of course, more money is put into doing elaborate analyses. And, and you can see this um, 
kind of uh, this trend kind of going forward into the future. And I, I would say this trend is very much what you also see for imaging. It's quite amazing. So if you think about like the first photograph done, this is a like Daguerre, you know, hundred and so odd years ago. Of course, all the effort and money went into making that photograph. The choice of subject and the analysis of the photograph is very minor. But nowadays, taking a, um, a picture is so deeply trivial. You People take thousands of pictures incidentally with their iPhones or with various cameras they have mounted in different places that the actual data acquisition of images and pictures is nothing. And nowadays, the big thing is picking good subjects to take good pictures of and also really thinking about how to do analysis on huge image repositories, right? That's where the action is in images. So it's very different. And this, this type of scaling is this course, this is really what has given rise to um, biomedical data science. Now, um, one thing that's interesting also is within biomedical data science, we'll talk about this, people have developed different algorithms and we'll talk about this in detail later. And what's interesting, you can see almost a kind of Crider's law uh, S type of thing where certain algorithms are developed for one phase of the amount of data and they get supplanted by others. And maybe people have heard about, we'll talk about this, the Needleman Wunsch and the BLAST and the BWA. These are different algorithms for aligning to nucleotide sequence. And they became very popular when there was a certain scale of data. But, but then when the scale increased too large, you had to, use, to move to a different, different type of algorithm all completely. And we'll, we'll talk about this more. And I think another big um, result of this is the birth of this discipline, right? So this is what we're talking about now, biomedical data science or bioinformatics. And you can see that really just, I think, it, dramatically in terms of the number of faculty positions for this. Now, this is an old graph. Actually, I did this years ago, and you can see it was going up um, years ago. This even predates a lot of the excitement about data science. But I think the key uh, notion is that the people like myself or the people that do this type of analysis, it really has become a very um, popular thing, mostly because we have fast, faster and faster computers and we have bigger and bigger data sets. And that's what's really driving this type of thing. Um, and I think a big uh, success, well, you might say, well, what have we achieved from all the analysis of this type of things? I think a big, there's sort of two successes I'll kind of just put out there right away that people have really done. One, I think is really these genome-wide association studies. And we'll talk a little bit more about what they mean later. Uh, one thing that's useful to mention is one of the first genome-wide association studies was, was or fact, the first genome-wide association study was done at Yale, and it was actually for macular degeneration, this paper, Klein et al. And I think one of the key points is that there's been more and more of these studies, and now we almost have databases of genome-wide association studies where uh, left and right people are associating all sorts of things with the differential, different nucleotides we have in our genome. And I think another uh, big success has been realizing that these, most of these associations are not to the genes in our genome, but to non-coding regions in our, our genome. And really a big success has really been kind of annotating the human genome and annotating these non-coding regions and, and realizing what they're doing. And actually this is a picture that shows how they're all connected into kind of a complicated wiring diagram or a regulatory uh, network. Um, so, you know, where are we um, looking into the future for this? Um, you know, there's a lot of new initiatives you've maybe heard about. We've mentioned the UK uh, Biobank. There's also the Precision Medicine Initiative, Genomics England, that are really building these uh, huge integrated uh, data sets. And we, of course, have heard of maybe a number of companies, very prominent ones are 23andMe and Foundation Medicine, which are really bringing this uh, large scale geno uh, genotyping and um, analysis to, to the world. And we expect more of this stuff uh, going forward. Um, so let me tell you a little bit more about future view of biomedical data science. So I actually think that, um, <laughs> I, I probably won't be around for this, but I actually think um, that eventually uh, biomedical data science will so take over and genomics will so take over um, uh, biology that you will, we will no longer have a course like this in the future. And in particular, um, what do I mean by that? Well, I, right now, or when I first started teaching this, particularly took talking about genomics and so forth, 
this class was thought of, well, the way it sort of is now, it's a 400 level class, you know, that's a specialist class that, um, you know, you sort of learn basic biology first, you know, we have prerequisites, we'll talk about that in the class, you know, you have to learn about DNA and basic things, and then you come to, um, you know, genomics, and then eventually maybe even bioinformatics or biomedical data science at the very end, and like, oh, you can sequence a lot, and you can collect all this information, what you can do. And that's the traditional way that people came to this, to this subject. And, and that's probably a way a lot of you are coming to it now. You've, you've taken a, um, uh, a full curriculum, and this is a, a specialty class you're taking at the end. And that's the traditional way of doing it. But um, what I think is going to happen in the future is, is very different. I think that if you imagine um, a future uh, where everyone's genome is sequenced. And uh, particularly if you were to get sick, they'll look at your genome. And this is particularly the case for cancer. And then you might think to yourself, um, how, what, what will happen to the average person in that situation? Well, the average person will be presented with a disease diagnosis, but they'll also be presented with, oh, you have all these different mutations and you have, you, we've done this big data set for you um, the, these are the places in the data set we notice things. And at that point, uh, then people will traverse back into biology. So they'll say, oh, geez, you know, I have these mutations here and here. What, what does it mean that this mutation's in this gene? Oh, this mutation seems to be associated with the transcription factor. What does that mean? Oh, that's a controller protein. Ah, very interesting. Um, and, or, oh, oh, this mutation here, um, you know, it seems to be under this type of selection or not that type of selection and so forth. What does that mean in terms of the population dynamics? And so I think actually what will happen in the future is um, people will start with the data, start with their genome, and then go backwards into biology. And we're going to do a little bit of that in the class. As I'll talk about, we're going to sort of use the personal genome as into a kind of a gateway into biology. And we'll talk about that in a bit in the class. And one of the key things I think when you think in these terms is what biomedical data science does here is it puts your um, genome or your health information, okay, into the context of other people. Because in a sense, the best way to understand, well, I have this mutation, what do I make sense of it? Well, the easiest thing to do is to compare your mutation with the population cohort and say, oh, well, you know, a lot of people, 50% of the people in the world have that mutation, it seems very harmless. Or, oh no, no, that's a very rare mutation. It potentially has a more deleterious impact and so forth. Or, oh, we this mutation has this effect and we've seen it in these other people that have this particular phenotype. So a very big part, I think, in, of biomedical data science is taking uh, your personal data and putting it in context of a bigger cohort. And we're gonna be talking about that uh, a bit, particularly in the final project. Um, also, when we think about the future for biomedical data science, I think we should think a little bit about the data, how it's going to scale. We've talked about how it's largely been driven up to now by this exponential increase or hyper exponential increase in sequencing data. But more and more, uh, what we might be seeing is um, different types of data. So actually, originally, before the the explosion in sequencing, actually a lot of the large scale data science in biomedicine was driven from more physical perspective, molecular perspective in terms of molecular structures, but these didn't increase as fast as sequences. But nowadays I think imaging people think is very much uh, a new technology, particularly with cryo-EM and other forms of imaging really might be giving us a, a much larger component of our biomedical data science. And so we wanna be thinking about that. Uh, and then this, uh, picture just kind of shows um, this type of thing, the, the scaling just in terms of more specifically in terms of the number of exomes sequenced or the number of structures being deposited. And I think you can uh, just see the rapid increase in sequencing versus the structure stuff. One of the interesting aspects though um, of this is even though we're getting this really large increase in the number of genome sequence, Struck molecular structures being done so forth. The, the amount of new basic biological facts is actually not necessarily increasing. 
And that's one that that's good. That's one of our the main powers we have in biomedical data science. So the amount of data increases, but but increasingly we lump it into well-known bin. And that's um, actually shown very nicely shown here in terms of the increase in size of the structure database, which has all the molecular structures, which as you can see increasing appreciably every year. This is a rate of increase on the y-axis. But the number of new molecular shapes or structures, which is shown by the increase of these two databases, is substantially less and falling quickly. And that the implication is that we're kind of saturating the number of basic shapes we have in uh, biological sciences. Um, one other, uh, I think, thing to think about in the future of um, biomedical data science is kind of how this will play with other parts of um, of data science in general, you know, and so we might think a little bit about, uh, you know, how we will be importing ideas from other other fields, non biological fields, into the biological domain. I think a nice import to talk about is network science, and we're going to be talking about that a lot. That was very popular uh, a number of years ago, where people were developing a lot of ideas about network connectivity. This was, say, related to say social networks, you know, sort of hubs in social networks and so forth, or electrical networks or, or um, wiring networks, but they proved very powerful to think about molecular networks or neural networks as well. Um, we can also think about um, types of um, technical exports from biomedical data science to other types of uh, data science in general. I mean, one of the most popular techniques in, um, uh, data science is latent Dirichlet allocation, which we might talk a little bit about. This actually, which is mostly used to analyze uh, large scale amounts of text, but th this type of thing was really developed, this type of framework was really developed in statistical uh, genetics. You also see just kind of cultural exports in terms of ideas about open science and data sharing and ways we think about managing large collections of things. I got a big kick out of the fact that Pandora, which is this uh, streaming music service, when it first came out, it called itself the Music Genome Project. And nowadays you can go to this um, museum in Brooklyn, they, they talk about the Art Genome Project. Again, they're drawing inspiration and some ideas from um, the biomedical domain of how we how we dealt with the large amount of information in the genome maybe provides them with ideas of how to deal with uh, the information in the collection they're looking at. Okay, so let me just flip quickly. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little bit on the course, and then I'm going to go into the admin uh, a little bit of the admin section. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about what we should uh, teach you in this <laughs> class, and you know that's a hard. A hard uh, question. It's something I spend a lot of time thinking about because, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, good curriculum for computational biology, biomedical data science, bioinformatics, what, what we should have. And um, I've thought about, you know, I, I, I think there's, there's different bits. I mean, there's sort of bits that you need to know, but they're sort of associated with maybe computer science, just general computer science, like the concept of recursion, where, you know, that's something that you should probably know about or we'd like you to know about, but that's just general computer science. Then there's general statistical ideas like distributions and so forth. Again, we're not gonna teach you that. That's something you probably wanna know about. And then there's general ideas from biology and chemistry, like what is DNA, right? And then there's some things that kind of, that you know we do, for instance, in um, bioinformatics, and they do in general statistics, but they're really so focused on in bioinformatics that they're almost a thing onto itself. For instance, Markov chain Monte Carlo. There's a lot of that. And we'll talk about that a bit. And then there's some um, very specialized calculations that are really unique to bioinformatics. For instance, uh, things like uh, models for gene finding from hidden Markov models or docking calculations and so forth. And so I can kind of think about where you would find these in different classes. And, you know, of course, what we're going to focus on here is really this kind of intersect uh, place between the biology and the informatics. And I, I think one of the key things to realize is that there's a kind of spectrum in this intersect between the mining calculations that we've talked about to, to where we start to bridge into the modeling and simulation. And so obviously the class, you know, has this mining stuff more at the beginning, and then we kind of bridge into more uh, simulation stuff at the end. And then what we're going to talk about in the remainder of the, the this class today is we 
I had a definition I worked on a long time ago. This is a, now 15, 20 years ago for what is bioinformatics. And I, I still think it's a useful definition. And we're going to kind of talk about each of these words, what they, what they mean and you know, kind of how to explode them in terms of what, what the discipline is really talking about. You know, thinking about uh, bioinformatics, exceptionally biology in terms of molecules, there's really this implicit molecular understanding we're talking about, uh, talking about the informatics techniques that are useful, talking about this idea of organizing mining and modeling, um, and also the notion that this is a large scale endeavor and that it's a practical uh, discipline.